<laughs> All right, folks, I'm having a good day today. And let me be the first welcome you to Autism Rocks and Rolls. Now, before we begin, I must know that I'm not Dr. Psychiatrist. If your son dies to diagnosed with autism, please see a physician, at least based on my experiences. I also have a mission statement I'd like to review with all of you. The mission statement of Autism Rocks and Rolls is to take the negative stigma off of autism and other conditions that many think are disabilities. People on the spectrum are not broken and do not need to be fixed. Those who have conditions or abilities don't have to be pitied. There's nothing to be sorry about. And there are some people i like to thank. First, I'd like to thank my grandmother for being my previous guest. And C222, accept them for who they are by Grandma Alice. More information. But what an amazing person and guest. Thank you, Grandma. Also, I briefly want to talk about one of my connections. Philippa Bagley, emotional coach and owner of Choose to Change, is a great place to go if you are having trouble with anxiety. Since I have trouble with anxiety, I use her services and it did make me feel relieved. Thank you, Philippa, for helping me out. I also need to talk about SEAT, Social Engagement Enterprise at Kelly. This is a program at Indiana University who like my work so much that they're going to help ARAR out with their marketing. Thank you, Sky. You and your team rock. We spoke with Karen Bonelin of the Query Radio Station last Wednesday. She will support our winter concerts coming up on December 17th by spreading the word about them. Thank you very much. We also value your assistance. We held the regular board meeting. We will celebrate the holiday season with the board next month. We are eager to celebrate with them. I also spoke to OcaliCon 20, 2022 virtual conference. I got to hear the stories of others, and I got to share mine. Thank you to all who were involved. The Kiwani's Idol was invited was invited to me by Jake May and Vanessa McCleary. I appreciate you all thinking about us so much. We had a lot of fun. On a personal on a personal note, I am on fire because two more chefs from Cutthroat Kitchen responded to my fan mail. They were the DJ chef and Chef Gernard Wells, better known as the Love Chef. Thank you guys so much for responding. And since the last episode, I was on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with Stephanie Hardy. What a great podcast. Now, folks, we'll be right back. We're going to hear an ad from the barn on Maryland Ridge. So let's get to it. There is a hidden gem in eastern Greene County, folks. Fowler's Pumpkin Patch and the barn on Maryland Ridge Wedding Barn. Autism Rocks and Rolls is very proud to tell you about our friends, Perry and Renee Fowler, and their place of business. Both Fowler Pumpkin Patch and the barn on Maryland Ridge is a relaxing drive approximately 15 minutes from the heart of Bloomington, Indiana, and an hour south of Indianapolis. You can find them at 53... 53- Four seven South Green County Line Road, Bloomington, Indiana, 47403. The property has numerous picture locations, including several rolling fields, antique tractors, red and rustic barns, trees, and much more. Customized wedding packages are offered on their website. The surrounding area also provides several hotels in which to have your guests stay for your destination wedding. Also, Fowler's Pumpkin Patch is a family-owned and operated seasonal pumpkin patch. It's the perfect place to take your family for some fall fun. Enjoy picking out pumpkins, hay rides, a corn maze and a petting zoo call the fowlers today at 812-327-4895 or 812-325-6022 all right folks we're back and you'll definitely hear the words i do at this wedding barn now today it's a great day for me because tommy stevens a former contestant from hell's kitchen and cutthroat kitchen champion is here with me despite being from lebanon new hampshire tommy spent much of his early years in buffalo buffalo new york he was raised in a, the family business because his father was a restauranteur. His life has always included the restaurant culture. In his mid-20s, Tommy first began to explore the world of food and gastronomy. Soon after that, he returned to his hometown of Brewster, New York, where he attended high school and started his first job at, at a full-service restaurant. His first eatery, Iron and Wine, debuted in Patterson, New York in 2017. With all this knowledge, you might be wondering why he's on my show right now. He is on my show because although he was on Hell's Kitchen, Tommy didn't alter who he was, and Tommy consisted a consistent on and Tommy consistently maintained a good outlook despite the demanding and stressful situations that Hell's Kitchen offered. As he put it, when I arrived in Hell's Kitchen, my goal was to create some passion and some art. The whole time I was here, I tried to stay true to myself, and what Tommy did is what ARAR believes in. So let's welcome the humble and cool executive chef. Tommy Stevens to Autism Rocks and Rolls. Tommy, my friend, how are we doing? What's up, brother? I'm doing good. That's awesome. That is awesome, man. And thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So my first question to you is, what does being an executive chef mean to you? 
Oh, a job with long hours. <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of like the family trade. We're a restaurant family. It's uh, it's something I've always enjoyed doing, even when I was a young cook. You know, the, the role of a chef is, you know, not too much different. It's a leap forward, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, overall runnings of a restaurant. But, you know, the true the true passion is in uh, recipe creating. That's that's the best part of the job, hands down. Oh yeah. And the, the creativity, I agree. That's what the podcast yeah. itself. We're both very artisty in a sense. Yeah, yeah. We, ex- we explain our own ways though. Yeah, for sure. Like oh. um I, oh, go ahead. I mean yeah, I was just thinking even when I was a young cook, I just said the best part was definitely, you know, crash course in recipes and trying to impress my my chef that was that I, who I was working under. And I love, you know, now that I'm a 43 year old man, I love seeing my young cooks in my kitchen come up with new ideas as well and it just it, it's lovely to see people express themselves through food it is expressing through food i've seen sometimes they that chefs don't have other like chefs who have trouble with other skills amaze you in a minute with their food yeah it's, that's what we do it's been it's pretty phenomenal now what were your initial thoughts when you learned that you were going to be an executive chef um, well, that was pretty much just I went out looking for that job because that's, you know, I when I was uh, working as a full time cook, I just I wanted to apply my mind a little more. So I just started looking for chef opportunities. My first one was a rather simple one in uh, Philadelphia at a pub that had a large uh, selection of craft beers. And I was allowed to do a small blackboard menu, like kind of like pub style where I changed it every week. But put specials up on a blackboard and just, you know, create different meals that I think people would enjoy and kind of grew from there. But I mean, that's can the you fun tell us what some of the, can you tell us what some of the specials were that you can remember? Uh, I used to do Guinness. My favorite was like, we did like a stout mashed potatoes with duck breast and a little cabbage. And that was my favorite, especially around fall, but I would, I would do that year round at the pub just because I, for some reason, I thought that was the greatest thing in the world when I was probably about 26, 27 at the time. And that was definitely my favorite dish at the moment. But yeah. um, that definitely probably yeah, was, that sounds really good, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, little, a little soul warmer. <laughs> yeah, I would say that. Now, in your brain, how do you think an executive chef brain operates? chaotically chaotic i'm constantly yeah for sure uh you know fired on all cylinders man um you know you, you constantly have to keep it you know tabs on your inventory your profit margins you're you know maintaining a price point making sure there's no wastage making sure everybody in the kitchen performs their job simultaneously or else it's more difficult for you to do yours it's uh you know it's a lot to wrap your head around but yeah, and some people are just built for it. It's what they do. And I mean, that's just what I've done my whole life. So I mean, I, I'm not very good at many things, but I could do that. <laughs> I, I feel you. I feel that way sometimes myself. I've had a lot of depression throughout my life. And I know sometimes I don't feel like I'm good at anything. But then when I come to this, that thought yeah. goes away. Yeah, do your thing, man. Yeah, exactly. What you got to do. Now, what yeah. is the most rewarding and the most difficult part of being an executive chef? Um, the best part is definitely just the freedom of creativity. I would say hands down, that's the most important part of any job that, you know, is a, a percentage of is an artistic approach. And, you know, to create something, whether you paint, whether you build, whether you cook is, I mean, for some people, some people aren't into it. And some people, it drives them. Those are the, you know, those are the creators. There's, you know, those are the artists in this world. And you need that part, first and foremost, just to keep your brain busy and to enjoy your daily life. That's what you have to do. I mean, enjoying your daily life is one thing. And like you said, it's the most rewarding part of the day is when you can enjoy your life and you're at a place where you can, again, be creative, but also build some passion, as you said. Yeah, exactly. Like take an idea and roll with it and watch it and you could, you could always improve on it. You know what I mean? You could always improve on something you do. Some people think you can't have no problem in revisiting something, but just to have that foundation of creativity, it just makes you feel like 
you have a greater feeling of accomplishment once something is complete, if you've created it as opposed to emulate. Oh, what do you mean by that exactly? Create it and emulate it? That's very interesting. What do you mean by that exactly? That's kind of cool to hear. Like for, for you to make something all your own is more satisfying than for you to replicate something that someone else has done. You know, ah, and, okay. You know I what I mean? Like, yeah, just you have that, that feeling of accomplishment that comes with it. Right, because it was your own work. You didn't yeah. cheat off the paper. Yeah, right? <laughs> now, what advice would you give to anyone else who is thinking about being an executive chef? Um, get some comfortable shoes because you'll be standing a lot. <laughs> That's a good one right there. I think my dad could use that. He's in a an electrician and I think that concrete yeah. kills him some days and I think sometimes yeah. he needs to get more comfortable shoes. <laughs> so I agree with that a hundred percent, my friend. Right on. Now I do want to talk to you about how you Hell's Kitchen, your appearance. So how'd you get the opportunity to appear on Hell's Kitchen? Well, I just, um, I applied, I was working at a country club and then they, um, they had a casting email that, that my manager at the golf club had just come across in the emails and he convinced me to do it on lunch break <laughs> and we made a bio and we sent it in and we applied and I had, I had never seen the show until I was on. I've never once watched it except for the ones that I've been on. So I didn't, I, I didn't even know I was going on a reality show. I thought I was, I thought I was going on like a, you know, a one day cooking competition. And then and next then, thing you know, uh, yeah. okay, I'm going to be crashing here for several days now. Yeah. It was a good time. though. It was a good time. It was a, lot, a good a time. Lot. Definitely. Now I, I do, I won't mention it, but there were some stressful times. So how'd you keep a good positive outlet going through those tough times? Cause I know there were times Gordon got mad at you. I know there are times that you thought, Oh, gee whiz. Yeah. Well, you're playing, you're technically, you're playing a game show food game show so i mean all you got to think of the whole time is you're trying to win you want to win you're on a game show you know you're there to win so i was i was just trying to freaking throw it together and come out on top yeah man i could see that and you definitely did there was my favorite there were a lot of times that i loved you during the show there was one time it was at the very beginning it was this this kid he had to wake you guys up early doing the whole rock and roll yeah and Everyone yeah. was so mad. It was like, oh, God, uh, I got to get up so early. Uh. Then you're over here like, oh, sweet, man. I expected, <laughs> expected I expect it. I, I was expecting to be woken up early. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I love your grape jokes. Your grape jokes, man. That were great. I, I thought your team that was going to kill you. I really did. <laughs> nice. Yeah. It, it makes you feel any better. Your jokes were great. I'm full, I'm full of bad one-liners. Yeah. Don't worry. I'm with you, too. I'm very punny, as they say. But, um, <laughs> yeah, your jokes, as they, you said, were very appealing. Yeah, yeah, you know it. They were. And let me. do you still keep in touch with your Cutthroat Kitchen friends, like Will, Paul, or? Yeah, I, I mean, not all of them. I definitely probably talk to Will, Paul, Jen, Jamie the most. We have like a little group chat, say hi to each other around the holidays and stuff. Oh, what were they like? May I ask them? Were they pretty cool people? They were all cool people. Yeah. Everyone was super nice, man. I met good people there. I could tell you. Will, Paulie, I think is still down in Florida. I'm not sure. But I know Will's Will's got a new gig in the city doing uh, the handcraft burgers, which are looking great. And uh, they got a couple locations open, which is awesome. I've yet to go. But I was talking to him a few months ago about it when it was kind of just getting uh, getting rolling forward. It was good to hear his voice. Oh, I bet it was. Now, I bet there are a lot of contests, a lot of people out there thinking about entering Hell's Kitchen. So can you give any advice to those who are thinking about entering Hell's Kitchen? I'll just do it. Don't let the distractions distract you. Keep your eyes on the prize. Oh, that's a good one right there. Keep your eye on the prize because... You're right. That prize was pretty big, I think. And you, yours was the BLT Steakhouse, right? That's what. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, okay. I want to make sure with that. Now, how, you did get eliminated, unfortunately. So 
you did take your elimination very well, and I applaud you for that because I know some of them didn't take it to the best. But how did hey, you feel know. when you got eliminated? I don't know. I wasn't very upset. I was in a game show. I, I didn't even understand why people thought it was upset because, I mean, it's not the end of the world. I still had a home and a job and friends to come home to. It's not like I was returning home to nothing. I just returned home to my normal life afterwards. Yeah. And but, uh, getting- yeah, I mean, it's fun. If you're all, you try to win, but it's not the end of the world if you don't. You're 100% right, man. And getting in Hell's Kitchen is honestly a great nomination itself. Yeah, for sure. No, it was, it was fun, man. Gordon's a good dude, too. Oh, I was He's, about to say, are you sure about that? Because we only see the yelling. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. They show you the yelling. He's he's, he's a great guy, man. Oh, he, I, he, I've seen him do some nice things for people. So. Yeah. For, yeah. Now, now, I do want to talk to you about some one of the reasons why and one of our missions is being kind to one of each other, just being a good human being. So who is probably the biggest person that taught you right from wrong? Oh, wow. That's a, it's a deep question. Um, well, I would say obviously my parents, but I would say my grandparents. That's always a, a big, you know, a big, a big home run in terms of driving that one home is definitely my grandparents on my mother's side who, who we grew up with the majority of our lives. Um, my grandmother had raised nine children with polio. She had the patience of a saint. So she was always a great role model because that's no easy task to raise nine kids paralyzed from the waist down. And oh. it just, you know, when you watch that woman be patient in any given situation, you try to adopt the same patients. That's awesome. Do you think you have adopted the same patients? Probably not. I work in a restaurant. Fair but... enough. I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. That's all I you do can best. do, right? It's all you can do, man. But yeah, now... I actually I do a lot. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, bro. I do a lot of charity work with the American Cancer Society. Every year we do a dinner in memory of my grandmother because she passed. And I actually work closely with Tracy Walsh locally, who when when before I was born, when my grandmother would do work with the American Cancer Society, she, her partner at the American Cancer Society that she'd collaborate with at the time, I forget her name, I never met her, but her young secretary in her teenage years was Tracy Walsh that I coincidentally met. And now I collaborate with, you know, 30 years later doing charity dinners and things with the cancer society through her. So a kind of apple didn't fall far from the tree. We try to carry that torch every year. Yeah. And I just learned that. I want to thank you, but let's get into that a little bit. So how did your, how did your grandmother, not your grandmother's cancer battle affect you? Um, it was, it was very, a lot of it was kind of caught late. So it wasn't, it was probably about a year and a half where really, you know, we saw her health, you know, take a turn, but she was fighting through it. I mean, she was a tough broad, so she fought through to the end and she smiled the whole time and she's a sweetheart, but it was, it was my first hands-on like close experience with cancer just how it affects families and people. And it was intense. You know what I mean? I, you know, you can't change anything about it, but we just did our best to be there, be there with my grandmother, be there for my grandmother and just help her in her older years. She lived a long life. So it was, you know, it was, it was a late in life thing. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't like, a, you know, too young in life, but it's still, you know, it was something the family came together and uh, kind of dealt with. Yeah. Is that why you um, shaved your head for her? If you don't mind me asking. No, actually, I always had a shaved head. I, the only reason I had hair on Hell's Kitchen was because I had a bet with my dishwasher, a $100 bet, who can go the longest without cutting their hair, just for fun. Because I always had short hair in the kitchen, as did most of the employees. But it was I was working at the country go at the time, and my little dishwasher from Guatemala, Lenny, he said, he's going to make me a bet to see who could have Jesus hair, is what he said first. <laughs> And so we both stopped cutting our hair at the same time to see if we can grow it the longest and made a deal that the first one to cut their hair would have to chuck up a hundred bucks to the other one. 
and he treated. And when I was on Hell's Kitchen and I still didn't cut my hair, he cut his hair and I came back and his hair was gone. <laughs> and I You're gave like, help for it. Oh, I won the bet. Nice try. <laughs> I, I won the bet. <laughs> yeah. I like my hair short too. I mean, I don't like it long because <laughs> mine grows out like nuts and then I turn into a, and then it looks like a big afro from the 80s. Nice. So, my hair grows fast. Mine does too. Except mine doesn't go like yeah. down. It just goes like out. out. Crazy. Yeah. Like you got your little outlet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nice. Now, what? let's go into more about this niceness. So is there any advice you can give to those who might learn from their mistakes and are trying to do right? And I'm not just talking about like a kid who had a tantrum and he's trying to fix his mistake. I'm talking about those who have went the wrong way because I'm not saying I'm not saying you haven't. I'm not trying to get there, but you're just a nice guy and there are some people who could probably take something from you. Uh forgiveness is a virtue. Everyone has the capacity to improve themselves. That's what makes humans humans. The ability to take a situation, work it for the better, the the ability to focus on yourself, the ability to improve yourself. That's something that's lost on no man, as long as, you know, it takes a little bit of courage to do so. But everyone has the power to improve their own lives, to improve themselves as a person at any time in their life, no matter what they've gone through in the past. Exactly. Because let's be honest here, you can start your life at any point, really, and do good at any age. Absolutely. You know, you don't have to start. At five, you can start. You can start at five, but you can start later or sooner. The choice is up to yours. You can make out of it with your life. Yeah, hundred percent. Life is what you make of it. That's what they say. That I agree with you, man. Now, in your opinion, I have my own opinion of why it's important to do this. But in your opinion, Tommy Stevens' opinion, why is it important to be kind in this world? Geesh, uh. Because it makes the world a better place around you, I suppose. That's a good why answer. Would, you know what I mean? Why wouldn't you? Yeah, you you would think that, but there's so much people who I'm not trying to name names on Hell's Kitchen, but who are who were probably disagree with you and slap you in the face for that because they yeah. probably don't agree. But there are yeah. some there who, and I'm not just talking about on Hell's Kitchen, but outside of Hell's Kitchen, who would look at you like, really, dude. Because I want to be mean, and nah, 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 it's better. I mean, yeah. Well, some people are just miserable. Usually, if you meet somebody that's angry, they're probably miserable. It's usually how the world works. It's a simple law of human nature. Yeah. If you ever meet a happy person all the time, it's probably because they're a nice person. Yeah. And I, and you know, Tony, it took me a long time to learn that, brother. I thought I was bullied a lot. And the whole time, I thought I was the problem. When in reality, I should have learned they were the problem. Yeah, for sure. And just roll it up your shoulder. Don't sweat it. I know. I mean, like you there. said, it's your life, brother. You make a you make what you make out of it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And yeah. I've been through, let's put it this way. I've been through hell. Yeah. <laughs> there. Yeah. Now folks, we'll be right back. We're gonna hear an ad from Bob Cannon in Ellsville, Indiana. So let's get to it. Are you wanting to do construction in your life? If so, Bobcat at Ellettsville, Indiana is the place for you to work. For 60 years, Bob Pearl and the other six locations have been offered as a resource to construction equipment and sales. They can provide you with Bobcat equipment, Bronkite trailers, Phil power tools, Echo Outdoor power equipment, Renmax power equipment, and Xmark commercial mowers. They also carry the products that are called Xaviators, Compact Track Loaders, Skid Steer Loaders, Versa Handler, Telescope Tool Carriers, All-Wheel Steer Loaders, Utility Vehicles, and Toolcat Utility Work Machines, plus a wide section of attachments. Be sure to use their services and give them a call at 800-825-9132. All right, folks, we're back, and you might check some, might check, you might find some Bobcats. You never know. Now, Tommy, I do want to talk to you about your appearance on Cutthroat Kitchen. So how'd you get to appear on probably one of my favorite food shows cutthroat kitchen jeez how did i I think they just called me and asked if i wanted to be on it i don't think i applied i think i think they somehow got that from casting for house kitchen so i'm in some kind of a 
you know, Rolodex or database. But that show was fun because it didn't take a long time, which was nice. And it was and I had good people I met on it, but it was just it was a lot of fun. It was just a fun show. It, it was a fun show. And not to brag, but I did have um, I don't think the judge you had, but. Another cutthroat kitchen judge, Simon Majumdar and C1117 into Simon Majumdar's cook has more information for the listeners and for you too, if you want to check that out. But um, he was definitely a pretty good guy and I wish you would have met him, man. He's pretty cool. Because I've heard on the show that the judges and the contestants don't get to really, you know, roll elbows with them. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, we don't talk to them too much. I think I had, I remember, I think I had Jet Tiller. Um, uh, there was a gal with Antonia Lafaso. Yes, yes, that was her name. Good yeah, call. Because was... you appeared twice. You appeared on the uh, one you won, the original one that you won, and then an Evilicious tournament. Yeah, there was that one too. Yep, yep, yep. And but, yeah. just that curiosity, out of all the sabotage, out of all the sabotages you went through, and I'm talking about your Evilicious one and your regular one, which one was the hardest sabotage? That you had to go through in Cutthroat Kitchen. Oh, I remember the, what was it? One of them you had to use your left hand. I remember that one. That that's pretty difficult. But then there's different degree of difficulty. That one was at least relevant to food. There was another ridiculous one when it was like me and my partner dude were riding around trying to walk around in like a cardboard car or something like that. Oh, I remember and that one. I remember yeah. that one. fast <laughs> food meal. Got to go in the car. Yeah. That's difficult for a whole new reason. That's oh, difficult. Yeah. Difficult to walk around with two people in a toy car without falling over. But <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was hoping, are we going to topple over here? Are we going to first time in the cutthroat <laughs> kitchen see someone fall? I just ripped the wall off, the door off of it by mistake. Like, just falling out. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's less cooking relevant, but more difficult, I imagine. Yeah, I, I could see that. And I did hear that you did, I did hear that you did get to cook an ancient mariner or mariner. So, how yeah, did you get to was- cook an ancient mariner? That was a seafood restaurant that I worked at for a couple of years in Ridgefield around the corner from my house. And then after I worked there, I moved to like a Spanish style tapas restaurant. That I cooked for, for a couple of years. And then, um, then I was pretty much by that time I was probably in my late. Yeah. Like, yeah, I would say like, nah, probably like early thirties where I was kind of just getting my stuff in order to, open my own restaurant uh and then, is that why you left yeah yeah okay i i figured it was but i wanted to make sure but do you have any good times you could share with us at ancient mariner oh yeah it was a fun place i mean all the all the regulars were great and um richfield's a great town it's a beautiful town it's right it's 10 minutes down the road for me right now but um it's connecticut town and uh it's just really nice they have a lot of um you know family owned and operated restaurants there there's a great sweet shop and it's just like a little cozy american town where you can take a walk down main street on a summer night and pop your head in get some to eat somewhere go to places if you want to eat go out for the to the sweet shop for dessert it's just a nice cozy town check it out if you're ever in the area i i will what's the town again can you say one more time so i can process it please ridgefield 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 new york Connecticut. Oh, Connecticut. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I live in New York, but I'm right on the Connecticut line. So. I'm, oh, okay. Ridgefield, Connecticut. I'll definitely um check her out, man. I'll I'll remember that. I'm yeah. I'm a big traveler. I like to go around and see the world. So maybe yeah, Ridgefield, right? Connecticut's on the list. Who who knows with me? Nice. Now you do now currently work at your restaurant, Iron and Wine. So how'd you get to be an executive chef and the owner for Iron and Wine Restaurant? Well, it's pretty easy when you're the owner. You make yourself the executive chef. <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't know. I just got, I took a business loan and I uh, looked around for a location. It took about a little less than a year, but I was looking around just trying to find the right spot to do it. And I found a restaurant that was actually owned by my previous employer years back. And then I bought it from the guy who was selling it at the time and then just Got a couple of my old friends and a couple of my old cooks I opened with. And uh, they worked for me for a couple of years and moved on to better things. But um, I opened it with a couple of old friends, Matt and Josh, and they were my main kitchen guys. And then um, 
we just hit the ground running and uh, opened a tiny restaurant. Uh, and that's awesome. It isn't it then some new American to it too? Because when I looked online, it said new American restaurant. Yeah, I do like a world influence on like comfort foods and stuff. So it's just it's pretty much just whatever tickles my fancy that day. I'll cook whatever I feel like. Pretty much, I tell I people it's. You. I tell tell a lot of people that it's food that chefs want to eat on their day off. Got it. That works, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, speaking of the food, can you tell us? Can, I'll try that again. Speaking of the food, can you tell us some of the food you serve, and what would you recommend on the menu? Oh, I, I take a lot of different influences. We do like a spicy dan dan noodle, which is like an Asian style uh, flat noodle with a spicy kind of. Jezuan, like a Pichon style broth, which is uh, which is good. We do, we make all our own pastas, which I do every morning. We do a nice butter chicken, what I just put on the menu about a month ago. It's people dig. It's pretty much I change it whenever I get bored, but we do a lot of Spanish Mediterranean vibe kind of stuff, like small plates and tapas, and have a little wine bar. And I like a lot of small plates that everyone can share. I like the sharing element of food. To bring people together at a table, have people talk, share things, discuss things. That's part of the world that we're slowly slipping away from. Uh, do you have any like permanent foods on the menu though? Just out of curiosity, that stay there and don't change. Um, not really. There's some things that I leave on the menu. I mean, I don't know if it's permanent, like as in guaranteed forever. But about a year into business, I started doing a like a like a soy caramel glazed crispy Brussels sprout with sesame and people rave about them. So I have never taken those off the menu in the last five years. That's everyone's favorite. So that's pretty much a staple. There's always a burger, but I change it religiously. We always have like a braised short rib bolognese, like a pasta sauce, um, like a meat based pasta sauce. Um, there's always some kind of an Alfredo, especially in the winter time. We do a three mushroom Alfredo this year, which is great. Yeah, that sounds kind of good. I'm not a big fan of mushrooms, I'll be honest with you. But for someone who <laughs> might be a mushroom fan, that sounds really good. Right. Uh. Yeah. Now, I do want to talk to you more about, I noticed you have a lazy eye. So does a lazy, does the lazy eye get ever, does it ever get in the way in your life? And were you born with it? Born with it, hands down. If I close my, if I close my good eye, like I'm looking at you right now, I don't know if you can see my eyes, but. I can't see my phone. It's just a big blurry blob. If I open this one, my vision's great. <laughs> I've always had one good eye and one terrible eye. But I was, yeah, I was born with it. So my brain is kind of wired to just use my good eye. Like I don't, I don't really have, have issues with, I have, I have no point of comparison. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've always been like this. You're the one-eyed pirate. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> or you might as well get an eye patch on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had surgery on it. Three times about three years ago, four years ago, about yeah, look, I'm thinking four years ago sounds about right. And because my retina detached and it went blind. And it, I do notice a difference when it when it's not working. Because it's definitely different. At least I can see things moving when it's blurry. I know something's there. So I have peripheral. But um now it's funny, like I never really thought I depended on it that much with one good eye, one bad eye until I lost my bad eye. And then I was wearing an eye patch around work for a couple months after the surgeries and everyone was laughed at me because I ordered a white leather eye patch, like the nurse from kill bill on, on online. And I was wearing it around my restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, uh, may I take your order? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I do notice this, my favorite thing with the hell's kitchen. When you came in the first door is that tattoo on your forehead. I love it. The rock yeah. and roll tattoo on right there. And Still I know there. you're like tattooed everywhere else. So can you tell us about some of your tattoos and do any of your tattoos mean anything special? Yeah, I got one on the side of my head that looks like a, uh, it's a black rose that I got when my grandmother passed. The one I was telling you about. I also have a tattoo from when my father passed away. A couple years ago that I got, and it's a uh, it's a swallow. It's a, like a old American style sailor tattoo, with a couple of raindrops underneath it. Because old sailor folklore is 
if you're out at sea and you see a bird over the ocean, they say that it carries the soul of the deceased at sea from the water to the heavens. And I thought that was fitting for my father passing, considering we grew up on a lake together. Oh, that's cool. What what lake was did you grow up? What the what, what lake did you grow up on? Was it one I, of the? I, I live on it right now. Here, check it out. Okay, it's called, sure. It's called Peach Lake, and okay. it's probably hard to see, but you'll see a nice sunset out the window if I point my phone at it. Can you see it? Oh yeah, I see it. Yeah, that, that's very lovely, man. Yeah, that's outside. That's outside my front door. Yeah, that's called. You call it's called Peach Lake. Yeah, yeah, it's a little lake. It's small. It's yeah. about a, it's it's literally like a mile across, a half mile wide, a couple of neighborhoods on either corner of it, and uh, nice in the summertime. We go put around in a boat and go fishing. Oh, you you like to fish? Yeah, sometimes. Probably oh go man, fishing is one of my hobbies too. My <laughs> my and my dad um go fishing sometimes. Um, I'll tell you a good spot to fish is um what's it called? Um, Batesville, Mississippi. There's not oh, much there, but they have good crappie fish. Nice, nice. It's it's really good, and we take a lot of them home. We don't do it as much because we had to sell our pontoon boat because we didn't use it a lot. Yeah, but we're hoping to go back there to give me like a smaller boat and go fishing there and get some more crappie. Yeah. Nice, right up. Yeah, so definitely, if you're interested in for a, like good old fishing trip, Batesville, Mississippi's a killer, nice. man. Cool. Now I do want to talk to you more about. Sorry, I thought my bad. Oh no, I'm yelling at my wife. She to grab me a glass of water. Oh, um, so I do want to talk to you more about staying true to yourself because, brother, I couldn't believe how much I can't believe how much people change in in Hell's Kitchen. But you, sir, you stuck to yourself, and I'll admit it. I a hundred percent admire that, brother, because there are some, like I said, who change, who take uh, the easy way out or backstab. So. Why do you think it's important to stay true to yourself and honestly do what part what my mission is, and that is to be you? <laughs> uh, staying true to yourself is pretty easy when you don't give a shit about what anyone else thinks. <laughs> I love that, brother. I love that. And you know something? It took me 16 years to learn that. It took it me is. 16 years to learn you can't care what I was give a shit about you. And if you do, your life's a piece of crap. Yeah. It took me 16 years to learn that. There are many people that will have something to say, but if you ever quietly listen in life, it's always the people that have too much to say whose opinions don't really weigh that much. Oh, brother, yeah. I agree. I agree with you 100%, man. They, yeah. they, their opinions mean nothing, if you think mm -hmm. about it. Nothing at all. Nothing at all, and Okay, maybe we can get into this. How could others... Like who I once was, who learned to care what others think, can shift and learn not to care what they think, but also be reasonable, because well, it's a hard to, thing to do sometimes. You want to find something to focus on that becomes your focus, something you want to focus on, because a lot of people focus on what others think when they should be focusing on just themselves, improving themselves and doing what makes them happy. And when you do that, you become preoccupied with what makes you happy, preoccupied with what you want to do and think. And when your brain is busy fielding these things, these facets of life, then you don't have time to worry about what anyone else thinks. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, there's people that don't like my restaurant. It doesn't bother me. Just don't come to my restaurant. I'll probably still like you if I bump you in, bump in a line at the grocery store and shoot the shit with you. It's just, you know, some people like certain things. Some people don't. To just you know you just focus on the common interests focus on who shares opinions with you you know you focus on what things that you understand things that make you happy and other people will do the same naturally i agree with you 100 percent because what you what everyone does that makes them happy they can forget about the negativity the hard yeah. aspects of life that yeah. adults and children have to go through sometimes for sure now, I do got to talk to you about this. So I noticed you said when you left that you like chicken wings. So I got to oh, ask you, man, what makes Buffalo. good chicken wings? Oh, you ever go to the Anchor Bar in Buffalo? You got to check that out. No, I have not. That was, there's Anchor Bar. I remember, I've, I haven't been to Buffalo in a long time. I remember growing up, I was in, 
think elementary school years. But uh, all the time, my father used to always take us out for wings. And uh, we would go up. Uh, the Anchor Bar and Ducks are two staples of Buffalo that both kind of claim to be the first chicken wing spot and never settled the, settled the you know, settled the fight. But they, they're they both like, you know, like the, they claim to be the originators of the Buffalo wing. And they've been around uh, for so long. I'm not even sure. But we used to go there. I mean, in Buffalo, like, like, you know, chicken wing and pizza spots were everywhere growing up. We used to go to one called Lenovo, which was kind of my favorite one. And that one was like, uh, you know, your old school 50s style black and white checkered floor, neon signs in the windows, a couple of video arcade games. And it was just a cool family spot. And I remember my father taking us there, my brother, and my mother and I, when we were young. And that was always fun. Just pull out a pocket full of quarters let my brother and I have at it at the arcade. We would just eat chicken wings and grab a pizza, and that was what people did on Friday night. Gotcha. Grab some chicken wings. What 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 do you think are the best flavor of wings, though? Oh, it's a tough call. I love making wing sauces. Like I make them all the time, all kinds of wacky different ones, and it's a freaking blast. It's hard to name a favorite. Um, my new favorite is Alabama white barbecue sauce. Oh, so we do it. It's fine, but I gotta be honest. I'm Buffalo. The hotter, the better for me. <laughs> uh, I'm a spicy wing guy too. I love it. Oh yes. How hot do you like it? Like yeah. to the point where it's like, bur- not like burn your mouth, but you feel the heat or it does that to be extra, oh, extra hot. I'll take full on face rippers till I'm sweating through my clothing. I love it. Oh, same <laughs> too. I like the feeling. I know a lot of people are like, <sighs> yeah. But then I'm like, ah, oh, this is actually really good. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it too, man. And you can make a hot sauce taste good. It's possible. You know, some some spicy sauces taste terrible. Some spicy sauces are well made when they're spicy and tasty. You know, you can't sacrifice flavors. Yeah, you. that is true. And I know a lot of sometimes hot sauces do that. And it's just full on fire in your mouth. Yeah. But There's no fun. You know, I'm the kind of odd duck who likes the fire in your mouth. I wouldn't mind that some days. <laughs> <laughs> now, I it also said, and I quote, you like motorcycle rides. So where do you like to take your motorcycle on? Like, Oh, anywhere. Anywhere? Got, yeah, I mean, I put around New York. I mean, I'm from New York, so I put around New York. Uh, I mean, I would love to. My uncle has gone to the Rockies. And gone out west and taken a motorcycle excursion for like a week. Never done anything like that, but that sounds like a blast. I'm more or less, I have a little sportster and I like to just cruise around town, go out for a beer, go out for a burger. When the weather's warm, I'll pop around town on the bike and just enjoy spending the, oh, the me day too. with air in my face. My dad's like that too. He actually owns a motorcycle. Nice. And it's it's, it's pretty cool. He, he rides it when it's warm, but when it's cold, um, not I as much it. obviously, but... <laughs> Have friends that ride in the winter with like heated jackets and they're diehards. I I hate it. Oh me, me too. And plus, I want to do it in the I, cold because I hate the cold. Hate it, hate, hate it, it, hate it. Me too. I can't stand the cold. Oh brother, here's the deal. <laughs> the more I go out for I do necessities in the cold, the worse it gets on me. And I and my father's like, well, wait till you get to fifty two years. And I'm like, buddy, it's already been fifty two years with the cold. Is what it feels like right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can't stand it if it's colder than 50 degrees like if it's in the 40s i don't want to be out on a motorcycle uh if it's in the 50s i'll do it 50s i'm, I'm a big wussy when it comes to that too <laughs> yeah <laughs> now i do want to talk to you about this what the heck was this music video i found about you doing it's called guns on the run oh what hell yeah was that that's my punk rock band from when i was young Oh, is you younger? Oh, okay. I didn't know what it was. I was like, what the heck is this? I know Tommy's on here, but what's he doing? I was young, but like it was the the music video definitely was made by like one of my college student friends who does film. Oh, excuse me, I'm yawning. But yeah, you know, I mean, it was, it was you know, it was like a zero budget music video. Just do what we could with our computers at the time. Yeah. And, and at least it was something. There's sometimes a lot of you got prefer something than nothing, but. I think the problem was I was just confused on what it was. I was like, 
a, is it a music? I mean, yeah, you maybe, can buy a little, it. like you said, maybe a little more higher technology. I think you can buy it on iTunes, you buy the album. Oh God. Oh God. How much, how much buyers have you gotten? <laughs> yeah. I don't even know. I like, I, I, that was so long ago, but I did just get married and, and all of my best men in my, uh, wedding party where my uh my band growing up oh. <laughs> yeah you should did you guys play it at your wedding no i'm very rusty <laughs> I <have> to, <laughs> I once in a while but i was so well practiced back in the day and i have not, i do not practice as often as i should as a guitar player gotcha well folks we're right back we're gonna hear from unlocking the spectrum so let's get to it at Unlocking the Spectrum, we are committed to making the highest quality ABA therapy accessible to all children with autism. What's up? Can I run and blow my nose during the commercial? Go ahead. Wait. Go, 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 go. At Do Unlocking the Spectrum, we are committed to making the highest quality ABA therapy accessible to all children with autism. We pride ourselves in offering fun, compassionate, and data-driven programs for individuals with autism and unparalleled support for their families. Our personalized approach means that every unique child is given just what they need to reach their maximum potential. We are so happy to support Sam in his mission of taking the stigma off of autism. You can learn more about our services and employment opportunities in both Indiana and Texas at unlockingthespectrum.com or by calling 855-INFO-UTS. That's 855-INFO-UTS. All right, folks, and we're back, and you'll definitely unlock the key to success if you check this amazing clinic out. Now, you also, Mr. Steens, have gotten involved with Taekwondo or Jiu-Jitsu. So how did you get involved with Jiu-Jitsu? Oh, it's so much fun. I just kind of started around when I got engaged to my wife three years ago. And um, I just walked in and signed up and I ended up falling in love with it. It's a great freaking time. And oh, I, I love it. I still do it. It's three years later. It's, it's a freaking blast. It's probably my I, favorite hobby. It's one of your favorite hobbies, you said? Yeah. It's down. Yeah. Oh, bro. I liked it too. I, I didn't do jujitsu, but I did Taekwondo for the longest time, like through my um, school years. Right. And I had my instructors at C129, a black belt's journey for more information. But it definitely helped me a lot with self-discipline and standing still because I probably was a wild child at the time. Yeah. If yeah. that makes any sense, I did, you didn't know I was going to do. I, I was like a bad kid. I was just very mischievous, I guess yeah. is what you put it at. So definitely made me into a better person. And that's kind of the question with I have next is, has jujitsu helped you in any way as a person? If so, oh. how? definitely just makes you a calm minded person it actually makes you more peaceful despite what people would immediately think that is violent which it is but when you're taught that kind of thing you become a more calm peaceful quiet confident person where i mean you just you, you know walk softly carry a big stick as the expression goes it's just, uh, you know, it's just good for, it's just, it's good for your character. It just definitely does make you a different person. You look at things differently. Okay, let's go into a little bit more. What have you looked at differently? Oh, just I just don't really get as angry at anything Not anymore. It, it's strangely calming, and I don't really know exactly how. But when you wrestle around with a bunch of top tier martial artists all morning long, it's very humbling. At the same time, it makes you stronger mentally and physically. And then you learn not to really get upset at other things in life because they're so insignificant compared to if you were actually be in, say, a life or death situation where you would need to apply said knowledge. Like, they're, long story short, there are many greater things in life than what gets your average person angry that you should probably devote that attention to and not allow small things to distract you so much on your day to day as a lot of people let them. Right. And I, and I, I see that. I think sometimes we humans fly off the handle when we don't need to. Exactly. And then, you know, it, it improves your problem solving abilities, not necessarily physically. It just, you apply that physically in training, but then it just makes you more patient solving a problem outside of that world as well 
Yeah, I would agree with that. Now, I do want to talk to you about your wife. So how did you meet your wife? She was working at one of my restaurants back in the day. And then a couple of years went by and I bumped into her again and we ended up going on a date and ended up just hitting it off years ago and just didn't stop dating really. Gotcha. How, how does your wife helped you out from a personal standpoint? Uh, well, she works with me. So we both run the restaurant together. That's big. That's a big deal. <laughs> I'll give you that. I mean, has she helped you as a person as well? I mean, hundred percent. She's also maybe a more calm person. That's good. And Hey, a lot of times that's what people need in life is someone to <laughs> help them make them calm. And 100%. I think I'm, I'm still waiting for that someone, but we'll see if it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Now, folks, we'll be right back. We're going to hear from Great White Smoke. So let's get to it. In the town of Bloomington, Indiana, you can find the best barbecue meat at Great White Smoke. Owned by Dave White, Great White Smoke offers meat catering for events such as weddings and birthday parties. They've won awards such as the 2021 number one food truck in America Grand Champion and the 2019 Kentuckiana Barbecue Pitmasters King of the Q. If you're looking for someone to cook meat for your event, then Dave is your guy. Book them for your next event at 812-229-7571. You can drop them an email on their contact page as well. All right, folks, we're back. And if you check them out, you definitely won't be hearing smoke on the water, but smoke on the grill because their meats are pretty good. Now, speaking of meats and food, Tommy, we're going to wrap it up here, but these are just for fun. So my first for fun one is what is your paradise meal or favorite food? And why is it your favorite? And I'm guessing with you, is it wings? It's one of them. It, that's a tough. That's a tough question to ask someone their favorite food because I love food, obviously. Hey, look but, at me, brother. Look at me yeah. for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I definitely like a good old extra crispy buffalo wing is right up there. Um, I also, being a New Yorker, I love and it's got to be a New York uh, classic breakfast sandwich. I love a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich with an over easy egg, salt, pepper. American cheese on a J.J. Cassone's roll. And if you're from the tri-state area, you know that it's got to be a damn J.J. Cassone's roll. Otherwise, it just ain't a breakfast sandwich. Do uh, you like to add anything to your bacon egg sandwich, like sauce or pepper or just the way it is? Yeah, I'll try I'll dabble in hot sauce or ketchup once in a while, but I'm happy just the way it is. I don't usually order it, just salt pepper. Ah, uh, okay. What is your favorite movie or TV show? Now, my next one is, what is your favorite movie or TV show and why do you like it? Oh, wow. That's 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 an easy one. Favorite movies since I was a kid, hands down, are the Star Wars trilogy and Indiana Jones trilogy. George oh, Lucas is the Brother, that guy you just met, you got to talk to him at some point. He is the hugest fan of Star Wars I ever met in my life. Nice. And he, he likes anime, but I don't know how much you are with anime. Mainly with him, Dragon Ball Z, but... Yeah, I don't I don't know much about anime. I just I'm a, I'm a diehard Star Wars dude, and I love Indiana Jones, like the old three classic movies. And um, I don't know, good call. Other favorite movies: Goonies. I'm showing my age because all these movies are from the same, you know, late seventies, early eighties time period. But yeah, Goonies is one of the best movies ever made as well. Jurassic, that, Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Oh, that's a good one. Favorite. Like, that was great. That was more 90s, probably, right? Early 90s, trying to think. But I remember going to see that with my family as a kid, and I just thought it was awesome. I read the book. thought the book was great. But that's a great one still. I would agree. Now, what has been your favorite vacation you have ever taken, and why did you enjoy that vacation very much? Oh, that's an easy one. I've been in many beautiful places in the world, and many of them driven by my pursuit of food and influence on recipe design and i just but food aside which they did have some great food but i went to peru once and i got to go everywhere from the lost civilization of machu picchu up in the mountains at the top of the andes to the amazon jungle to these these catacombs under a monastery that literally were wall to wall, like caves filled with bones of dead monks. I, I, like that was hands down the most wild vacation in the world. Because back on your earlier question, I literally felt like Indiana Jones the whole time. 
getting on a tiny airplane that I felt like was bouncing around in the air and about to crash going over the, the mountains, you know, of the Andes mountains as I fly to the, to the to town of Cusco at the top of the Andes and then see all this, these ancient civilizations and cultures and relics of these old, just these, it's wild of literally these old civilizations that they just have the remains of that you, it's, it was like, it was such a spiritual trip. It's awesome. I bet. And did, doesn't Indiana Jones ride in like a mine cart? Or Probably. am I thinking of something else? Probably. I think in one of them, maybe in the new one, the fourth one. Okay. The reason why I'm saying is too bad you didn't have a mine cart. Then you would have got the whole experience, right? I know Donkey Kong rides in a mine cart. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> might. <laughs> you were Donkey Kong too a little bit. <laughs> now, but my final was... question is, are there any good memories that you want to tell our viewers about? If you do, why do you remember that memory the most? Now, before you answer, I like to end with like a good memory that made you feel good and was very sentimental to you, and a funny memory that made you fall on the floor laughing. It could be with Hell's Kitchen, Cutthroat Kitchen, your job, your call. You want to answer, my brother? That's a tough call. A memory. Um, geez. Well, a nice memory, a recent memory, but a great memory I can think of is. My father always had a motorboat growing up. And after he passed away a couple years ago, my brother came to visit because it was during COVID and they shut down all the restaurants in Manhattan. So he moved back home with the family and we were all hanging out together, going through tough times. And I surprised the family by buying a motorboat in memory of my father, because that's how we used to spend our summers as kids. And that was one of the happier days of my life is bringing that gift home to the family and and just kind of keeping Pop's memory alive and us all having a good time and going out together for the first time in so many years and watching the sunset on the water and all that is just such a huge part of my growing up that I just I was happy to bring that back to the family. I bet that was a great time. And on the motorboat, did you guys go tubing? Like, have you ever done that before? Like, My, my father was like fucking Dale Earnhardt with his children in tow behind the damn motorboat. I'm surprised. I'm surprised social services didn't come take us away from him. My, <laughs> father, my father was such a freaking hellion when we were kids taking us for tube rides. He would, he would, his goal, I, I swear to God, his goal was to save some money and ditch one of us off. Just have a sink to the bottom of the lake. He would be. <laughs> <laughs> that darn dad, right? <laughs> it's, it, it's still, every holiday, seriously, it still comes up. It's a conversation. How wild my father's tube rides were. When we were kids, send us like six feet in the air, like flying through the air, bouncing off this tube. My mother screaming at him. My father fucking flying around. <laughs> <laughs> I I I can imagine that. I'm I'm was I did a little tubing myself, but my issue was every time they would turn the boat, like you go, you go way over the sea. I'm like, well, I'm gonna fly off here in a minute. Yeah, my brother and I used to roll it. We do a barrel roll, and you go all the way other side. You do somersault on the tube and try to stay on. Oh, That's funny. And I got, I got another. I thought of a funny one. I can help you out with. So the funny one. It was the very last episode of Hell's Kitchen. Very last one. You were turning as a chef. Yeah. They, they got open the big box. You literally turn around and moon the contestant. The two finals. Yeah. Yeah. I think Will bet me that I wouldn't moon America, and I. <laughs> are you freaking kidding me? Of course I will. <laughs> and then you're like, Bing! and then I, I love he said in like the little confessional box. Well, there's him, 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 and Tommy's ass. <laughs> that was great. I somebody, thought, had, somebody had to do it. Yeah, I, I, I would have done it too. It's like, hey, you want to <laughs> moon them? Okay. <laughs> I thought I would have done the same thing, man. Uh, Is that that was, yeah that part cracked me up, man. That was funny. Yeah, it was funny. Well, Tommy, I think that's all. Is there anything you'd like to say or promote before we close her up? Um, yes and no. Uh, thank you for having me on. It was pretty awesome. And if you ever want an autism-related guest, I have a buddy named Richie who is a jujitsu practitioner who's huge into autism awareness. And, and is an avid like wrestling fan. And he goes to tournaments with us and he's, he's good at jujitsu and he would love, he would love this. If you're interested, I could put you in touch with him outside of the, the conference. Let's do it. Yeah. Gladly. All right. And thank you, Tommy. 
you were been you were a great competitor, but also you're an amazing person. My friend, I probably look look up to you a lot, and I hope you have a great day, brother. Thank you, brother. My pleasure.